Okay, Harold, would you uh, mind go ahead and introducing yourself, maybe uh, telling us where you were born and when? I'm Harold Burston. I was born in Boston in 1930 in the same hospital that my eldest child and eldest grandchild were born, but the hospitals kept changing its name. My parents were both born abroad. My mother came as a toddler to Chicago and came to the Boston area in about 1912. My father and his brother came from Germany in about 1915, just in time, sorry, about 1913, just in time not to be on the wrong side of World War I. I first came to Woods Hole as a child in the 30s. I can have a vague recollection of the fisheries building and the aquarium that were destroyed in the hurricane of 1954. I came again in the mid-50s very briefly on my way home, uh, probably to Cambridge, from Mystic Seaport, where I'd been speaking to the Munson Institute of American Maritime History. We started coming to Woods Hole regularly in the summer of 1961, and I've been here for all of, or part of every summer since. When I got out of the Navy in 1955 to get a master's degree in oceanography at the Scripps Institution, which is part of the University of California. In those days, its affiliations were to Berkeley, since it had been founded by the chair of zoology at Berkeley. But the reorganization of the University of California after the Second World War made Scripps a part of the graduate division southern section. The dividing line was anything south of the Lick Observatory in Santa Cruz was part of UCLA. That made the faculty at Scripps very upset, but there was nothing they could do about it. So my master's degree actually comes from UCLA, though I never set foot on the campus. I was always interested in science, and the fact that I was selected for the Naval ROTC, what was called the Holloway Plan, in 1947, brought me directly in contact with the oceans. The U.S. Navy decided that the Naval Academy could not produce as many officers as the Navy would need after the Second World War. So they set up a competitive program named for Admiral Holloway, who was the chief of naval operations at the time, where they chose uh, high school graduates and sometimes people already in college to take four years of naval science as part of an NROTC program at a university. Spent summers in the fleet or with the Marines, and then would graduate and be commissioned as naval officers. So I was in that program the four years I was at Harvard as an undergraduate. But then in 1950, well, the fall of 1951, after I'd graduated, instead of being commissioned and going into the fleet, I had been awarded a Fulbright scholarship to the Netherlands. So I went to 
the University of Amsterdam for a year and didn't commission, get commissioned until after I came back. So I was out in the fleet in destroyers from the end of 1952 to I think it was about October 1955 when I could get out a little bit early because I had arranged to go to Scripps. Scripps was such an informal place that even though I was starting a couple of months after the semester had started, I still got to uh, take the classes the second half first and then finish up. And I left Scripps in, uh, I guess, May or June of 1957 to go back home. And then I went over to England where I was starting a doctoral program in what was the oldest department in my field at University College London. But I found that department to be somewhat moribund. And at the same time, the Veterans Administration, which was supporting my studies, decided that since I already had one master's degree, I couldn't get a second one. And the University of London had a rule that in a subject like the history and philosophy of science, for which there was no bachelor's degree, you had to get a master's degree before you could go on for a doctorate. So between the VA pushing in one direction and the University of London in the other, I was left without support. So I went back uh, to Harvard and got my degree in 1964 when I was already a full-time faculty member at Brandeis University teaching the history of science and general history, Western civilization, that kind of thing. In 65, my Brandeis appointment was coming to an end and I wanted some National Science Foundation to support my summer research, I got a grant from the, uh, sorry, through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where I'd been spending summers. So in 66, I started at what was then Carnegie Tech. And I was there until 1973. Meanwhile, spending all or part of every summer here in Woods Hole. In 62, as a graduate student with nobody to talk to, I set up an informal history of science seminar, inviting various people, some of whom were local, like James Franck, the famous physicist who happened to have a summer home in Falmouth and people mostly from the Boston, but not entirely from the Boston area. And we would advertise it in science, sorry, in ISIS. And people would send me messages that they were, would like to come talk. And we'd pick a date and I'd set the schedule up. And that ran really until uh, I guess the earlier mid 1980s, but it never had any support and it was never formal in any way. I would just reserve a room at the Oceanographic and put out a notice both in the history of science publications and locally and people would show up. The U.S. Geological Survey coming up to a centennial in 1979, decided they needed a historian. So they recruited me and I began commuting from New Jersey where we lived to Washington 
or from Woods Hole to Washington, actually to rest in Virginia, outside Washington. And I did that until the post of historian of the survey was abolished during the Reagan years. And at that point, I decided I needed to do something else. So I went to law school. The but law school at Rutgers in Newark, New Jersey, swallowed me up. I was studying law with young people half my age, same age actually as my children. And when I was about halfway through, I realized I'd been married half my life. And I began telling my fellow students that. And that shook them up because they'd been married one, two, three, four, five years. Most of them didn't have children. So I graduated law school, got admitted to the New York and Florida bars, and began working at a law firm in Syracuse. When I passed the patent bar, I was recruited by fat patent firms and went back to commuting, this time to downstate to Westchester County, where I worked in a law firm for about five years. Then I came back to Syracuse and had the best job I've ever had. I was patent attorney for the U.S. Air Force Research Lab at Rome, New York, which is a long but high-speed drive from my house in Syracuse. But all during those years, I kept a membership in the History of Science Society, Society for the History of Technology, and participated to some degree in meetings, uh, writing, reviewing. I don't think I wrote a whole lot of articles once I'd gotten into law. I should go back a few years and say that when Paul Gross became the first full-time director of MBL, he was an old friend because we'd been summering here since 1961. And at a party at somebody's house in Woods Hole, Paul said to me, you know, you should really become a corporation member. I was very flattered because corporation membership gave one a certain standing in the scientific community and locally. So I signed up, paid my dues for however many years it took before I became what's now emeritus. And of course, the corporation has changed. It has one member, now the University of Chicago, and the rest of us are members of MBL Society. I got my daughter, who is about to become chair of chemistry at Wisconsin, and my son-in-law, who also has a doctorate in chemistry, but he's a physician at the University of Wisconsin. They actually met in Los Angeles, in part because they knew each other by sight from Woods Hole. My son-in-law had been here one summer taking uh, one of the MBL courses. And though they never met during that summer, when they showed up at UCLA as chemistry graduate students in the same place, they realized they knew each other by sight. My older daughter, 
along with my other children, went through the Children's School of Science uh, for every year they were old enough when we were here, but only my older daughter became an assistant and then went on to become a scientist.